So I guess you all are interested in animation since you're here, but uh, who works with animation? Who's an animator, animation programmer, QA? Raise your hand. There's few of you. <laughs> you will know what I'm talking about. And the rest, uh, I hope you will enjoy. So our today's topic, AI movement in Dying Light 2, stay human. This is our agenda. I will start by introducing myself, because most of you probably don't know me. Then I will give you an overview of the system, and we will take a peek under the hood. The next part will cover some of the issues that we encountered and the solutions to those. Uh, the next part will be about the network replication in four-player co-op. And the last part I will quickly summarize, tell you about our tools and plans for the future. So this is me. My name is Jakub Bentkowski. I'm a senior technology programmer at Techland. I work there since 2017. I'm passionate about animation. I was lucky enough to be a member of the Anim technology team for all this time. I specialize in various animation-related topics like editor and tools, uh, replication of animation for network, animation streaming, and of course AI movement, which will be our today's main interest. So, the AI movement system. We call system that we use for AI movement a locomotion. So, when AI makes a decision to go to a specific point, it asks locomotion to do so. It's animation driven, so it means that the character displacement comes from the animation asset rather than some simulation done in code. It traverses the world by playing those animations one after another. System is generic and not scripted. It picks which animation to use by itself, automatically, depending on the situation. It's built on top of the animation system. So you could say that locomotion is a node in the animation graph of the character. It can be transitioned to and from other systems and blend with other animations. Here you can see an example of locomotion in action. One of our characters, Hakon, is parkouring around the city. He acts as a mentor to the player at the beginning of the game. And an interesting fact about him is that both his face and his movements are based on David Bell, who is one of the founders of the parkour. So, what are the requirements that locomotion must fit? For the night chase gameplay, we needed to reflect the natural movement system, which powers the player's parkour. So whenever a player can go, we have to follow, usually. It must navigate at relatively high speeds, around several meters per second, making narrow turns in tight spaces. It must allow our characters to climb multi-story buildings, and finally jump over the streets to reach the buildings on the other side. There are also a few additional requirements. So locomotion must support the slower pace movement for the human AIs in the open world and hubs, and also the slower zombies like biters. And of course, it must work in the four-player co-op over the network. And here is another example of locomotion in action. Pack of virus are chasing the player. They are the primary zombie type used during the night chase. They are quite nimble. They can climb after the player and definitely keep up the pace. So, how do the virals know where they can go and how to get there? They do that thanks to the NavMesh. It's a simplified representation of the traversable geometry. And in case, in Dying Light 2, the blue areas are the walkable ones. On them, characters can move around while staring on the ground. And the green ones are connections. They connect separate NavMesh islands and can be traversed only by a dedicated jumping animation. So, if you want an AI to go from one roof to the other using that makeshift bridge you see in the background, we will ask NavMesh to provide us with a path. That path we will go to the edge of the building, then pass through three connections and get us to the other side. So, now that we know about NavMesh and that it can be traversed by using animations, how does locomotion make that happen? Well, since the system is animation-driven, not code-driven, we need to play animation in order to move. As you may know, animation can store displacement data for the character, and this is called root motion. Forward move movement may be simple, but how do we traverse a complicated obstacle course? 
We need to know more about the characteristics of the root motion. How fast does the animation move? Does it turn? Does it sway to the side? How, has, how high does the jump go? Especially for jumps, we must consider many different ways the connections can look like. Can we traverse all of them with the same jumping animation? If not, why? And how would those animations look like? We should take a look at the real world parkour. How does a person move around an obstacle course? How do they interact with the world? Let's consider a few basic types of connections. These are based on the real movements done during the parkour. The, this is not a full list, this is just a few distinct examples. So these two change the elevation. They allow us to go higher. They are called climb on and jump on. And what is the main difference between them? The first one requires a wall because the character will climb and use an animation with, uh, with the character that actually touches the, the obstacle. And during the jump on, they don't. So the jump on, the, the second one, is more versatile and can be used in more variety of places uh, for jumping on like suspended obstacles. And similarly for more horizontal collections, the climb over and long jump. Climb over is more constrained, character grabs the edge and vaults over it, so it must be aligned to it correctly. And long jump gives us more freedom, angle at which we approach and perform the jump doesn't matter that much. We can do it straight ahead or diagonally even, it's more versatile. Each type serves a different purpose, represents different kind of motion, and it's measured in a different way. We have dozens of types of animations that we support, many of which are quite complex because they serve a tightly defined purpose in traversing the game world. Let's take a closer look at one of them, the long jump. Animations of this type are used to jump over a horizontal gap without touching the obstacle. We expect such animation to consist of three main phases. Before takeoff, small part in which character runs up to the edge and anticipates the jump. Flight, where character leaves the ground, travels in the air, and finally touches the ground again. And third, after landing, when the character feet touch the ground again and try to recover from the jump momentum. What purpose do they serve? The running up part is used to sync with the previous animation. The second part is the actual jump. It can be stretched or squashed a bit to make it more versatile. And the last part, like the first, is used to sync, but with the next animation. We take such an animation and we analyze it offline during asset compilation. Focus on the markers numbered from zero to three. They are important because they are placed in moments in which the characteristics of the animation change. On each of those frames, we sample some state. That state includes current displacement of the root motion, represented by an X form, stance of the character, either left or right side, current frame time, and also a few other properties. We can use this data to approximate the motion. I will talk about why we need that in a moment. Now we know that each animation type has its characteristics, that we define these characteristics by using phases, and how do the phases look like based on the horizontal long jump. But single animation won't get us anywhere. We need to switch between them. Since long jump requires animation to start and end with running, we can gracefully blend with the normal run loop from these phases. But is that enough? We have a lot more to blend to than just the running animation. Well, in Dying Light 2, the two most important cases we need to handle are idle and run. Looking at this long jump, when the running up part ends, character will start anticipating the incoming jump. At the last moment between running and the actual anticipation, we can sample yet another state. We call that the max cutoff point. This will be the last point at which we can start playing this animation for it to look reasonably good. This gives us flexibility. If we want to blend to this jump from moving, we start the animation from the beginning and sync with the running part. If we are idling or standing in place and we need to jump immediately, we skip to the max cutoff point and play starting from this, from this anticipation. And same goes for the end. We have some part after the jump in which we need to lose the momentum before uh, returning to our run. This will be the first moment in which we can exit animation early. Let's call it a blend out. We sample additional state here as well. This gives us two ways to enter this animation, from start or from the cutoff, and likewise, two ways to leave it, 
from the blend out or from the end. Each of the animation types uh, has such defined entry and exit points. We call those points decision points. And using relations between them and their uh, relations between different animation types and their dedicated decision points, we can build a graph. We call this graph a motion graph. It represents all animations as transitions, arrows in the picture, and their decision points as states, the circles in the picture. We build it procedurally from the list of animations that is uh, provided by the animator. This is not an anim graph that is constructed by hand. Number of all these states and transitions you see here can vary and look differently depending on the content. What I'm showing you here is just some simplification. Usually we have hundreds of states and hundreds of transitions all generated uh, during the asset compilation. And this graph defines all possible moves our character can do at any given point. So, as you can see, from outside system, we can enter this motion graph in two ways, either from idle or from move. Uh, the difference is that from idle, we can start either by jumping or by start uh, playing a start animation and then running. And from move, is used to enter the locomotion from external system, like from a cutscene. Then we can cycle bet between basically anything we want. Other jumps, turns, some other run cycles. And then transition from locomotion to the other system by either gracefully playing the stop animation or by aborting at any given moment and letting that external system to handle syncing and blending. As you can see, not every decision point is connected with dedicated transition to the others. That means that there are some transitions that are impossible to make directly. We will get to that later. We know what motion graph is and how it looks like. Let's use it for something. The part of the locomotion that interacts with the motion graph is called the planner. Planner job is to plan the motion along the path returned by an avmesh by selecting transitions, which are the animations, through the motion graph. If we want to start movement from idle and make a single step forward, planner would first need to generate a start step, starting from that in idle state. Next, it would generate a regular move step. You can see how planner would progress through the graph with the transitions marked in purple. This sequence of steps is what we call a plan. You can see it underneath, underneath the graph. Currently, our plan ends with the move step, which means planner can generate next step with any transition outgoing from the move step. You can see that some of the decision points have transitions pointing back to them. These are animations that support blending back to themselves. Thanks to this, we can generate a run cycle with how many steps we want, or we can run around the circle with the turn animations, or we can jump from obstacle to obstacle, which is crucial if you want to parkour through a dense obstacle course, which is the city in Dying Light 2. But how does the planner select which animation to play? Let's say our character, Hakon, is standing still and will attempt to jump on an obstacle, as you can see on this video. Planner will consider three different plan variants. This is the first one. It will look for a jump animation that best suits the dimensions of the obstacle. Since we simulate all animations offline during the asset compilation, we can use that sampled phase data that I talked about earlier. At designated points, we have sampled a state which includes root motion uh, X form. This allows us to approximate the movement without accessing the animation file directly. This means that during planning, animation files are not needed in the memory. We can use that approximation to check if we match the obstacle. If the jump animation is long enough, as seen here, it means that it covers the horizontal distance to the obstacle and can be played directly jumping from standing pose. This is the second variant. Because the flying phase of the jump animation can scale, it can be stretched or squashed to fit a wider, wider variety of obstacles. But there is a limit to it. If we stretch jump too much, it will look bad. If we don't have a better jumping animation, since this may be our only one, character will have to run up to the obstacle a bit, make a start move, and then jump from a closer position. And the third variant, if the distance is really big, we can generate as many steps as needed. 
to close the distance between the character and the obstacle. But there is also a limit here. We usually don't want to generate more than two steps in the plan. Why? Our gameplay is really fast and the situation changes from moment to moment. What we want is for AI to react quickly. Because of that, instead of planning entire motion for the whole path, we generate only two or one steps and call planner again at each new decision point that we reach. This way, we don't waste time planning and executing a motion that is outdated because AI decided to change the direction of movement. Planner and motion graph are not everything though. The rest of the locomotion, which we'll be simply calling the runtime, also has a lot to do. It manages requests coming from the AI. It issues the path queries to the nav mesh and issues replans on the planner. It manages corrections. We are pushing a physical object by using animations, so there might be some differences between how we expect uh, root motion to be applied and how the physics system handled that. So, to quickly summarize the overview path. We have a motion graph that describes our range of motion, all the actions that we can take and connections between them. We have a planner which uses that motion graph to plan the actual motion along the path and the runtime which oversees the execution of the plan, manages requests and connections. So, now that we have some basic knowledge about what locomotion is and how it works, we can proceed to the issues and solutions. I will walk you through some of the problems that we encountered with the system. So, the first problem is amount of animations. The more we have, the better. We can cover a wider variety of moves, of moves. but we need to consider memory usage. The size of the motion graph increases exponentially. For example, most of the motion graphs uh, in our game share jumping animations. So, instead of storing copies of repeated jump data, we detect that and we share it between the different motion graphs. Do we have to create at least one animation for each type? Probably no. If no, what is the minimal set? Turns out that many of the animations that we used are there only to improve the quality. So, not all of them are needed. So, what animations are needed? The minimal set consists of the forward start animation, a single run cycle, a sudden stop. It's a special stopping animation with no root motion. It allows our character to stop immediately in place. A uh, similar one is the sudden jump, so-called jump from idle, which can be executed uh, also very close to the obstacle. It has no forward root motion. And same for 10 in place, uh, no position displacement, only rotation. And here you can see a comparison of those two motion graphs. The one at the top is the simple one. It has only a single start animation, single stop animation, turn in place, and of course the run cycle. And the bottom one is more elaborated. It uses dedicated directional start and stop animations for different angles. And it's also faster. It reaches the target position in less time. Another problem occurs where animations are too large in terms of space. Some of the cases can be alleviated by using those in-place types, turn in place, sudden jump. But what if we don't want to lose momentum? Our zombies need to keep up the pace with the player. When we try to plan a turn animation, as it is, it might be too large spatially. That means that the character takes too much space in order to make a turn. This results in this peculiar behavior. Character is unable to turn in tight space and falls down from the obstacle. You can see the path which character would want to take, marked in red. So, since turns are too big, character hits the wall or either falls from the edge like a car that loses grip on the road. We don't want that. So, we measure a space that is available for us on the nav mesh. We shoot our traces ahead of us and to the sides, and we appro approximate how much space we have to play that animation. So, we know how much space we have, we need to feed a turn in there. We can manipulate root motion, but it might not look good. If it loses its characteristics and relation to the character pose, character will slide and that would look bad. Trick is to apply position and rotation corrections separately. We apply position correction only when character is in the middle of the step, so where the legs are passing each other. 
And on the other hand, rotations are applied only when there is a single foot touching the ground. You can imagine yourself standing on one leg and using your body weight to shift yourself, rotate yourself a little. The next problem is jump scaling. As I said many times, each jump type has a face which can be scaled, squashed or stretched to fit the obstacle geometry better. But as I also said, there are limits to this. We can't squash jump down too much because there is a solid ground beneath us. When we squash too much, character feet will go through the ground. Why does that happen? In some animation types, pivot position is placed between the hands at the end of the jump. That's because the character pivot must be aligned with the edge, but the character grabs the edge with its hands. This means that the relative position of the pivot and the pelvis is changed during the jump. So at the marker with the number one, the pivot is between the feet, character is on the ground. Between the markers one and two, the pivot travels up. In the middle of the, motion, of, of the animation, it's at the height of the knees. And at the end on the marker number two, the pivot is between the hands. So let's see what happens if he wants to play this animation at a very low obstacle when that uh, scalable face is scaled down to zero. So even though both feet are over the ground at the beginning and at the end of the animation, there is a moment when the character travels from the point one to point two, during which the feet intersect the ground. This looks really bad and we don't want to happen that uh, at all. So what do we do? We need to measure the minimal height supported by this animation. Measuring at the specified points is not enough. So we measure the maximum feet distance below the pivot during the whole phase. This way we know how far feet go below the pivot during the jump. We need to add that to the distance from the feet to the pivot at the end of the animation. Note that there might be some animations in which that distance is the same. So this means that the lowest supported height might be two times the distance at the end of the animation. If there is a vertical root motion during other phases, it needs to be also added to the jump height because there might be some vertical wall run like movement at the end. Character touches the wall and then tries to run up a bit and only then catches the edge. We can scale the flying phase to the zero, but we still need a vertical space to play that run up at the end. This goes for all animation types, including the ones that are jumping down. There is another thing we need to watch out for. If motion graphs needs to support jumping, it needs to support it for the lowest possible connection height. That's why we usually have a dedicated jump on animation without fixed parts and without relative uh, pivot displacement as a base. The next and the last issue in this part is streaming. And it's not really an issue, even though all locomotion animations are streamed. That's because we don't need all, all of those animations in the memory during the planning. We plan motion based on the approximation embedded in the motion graph. Animations are needed only when the plan starts execution. This gives, a, this gives us a time window between planning and execution in which we can preload the beginning of those animations. Additionally, streaming cache is pre-warmed during game startup with the most common animations. Unfortunately, jumps are not so common. Some of them are very unique and might not stream in time. We have a separate mechanism for that. We analyze the path ahead, looking for connections and try to pre-select animations for them early. This information also benefits the planner. We can align ourselves better even before we jump. So this is the last issue. Let's go to the next part and it will be something. Replication, so synchronization of data between players over the network. As you remember from the beginning, from our requirements, locomotion must support four-player co-op. So how do we approach locomotion in co-op? Since our movement is animation-driven, not code-driven, most common solutions like debt reckoning are not enough here. And at the beginning, it looked something like that. So we can't apply ordinary movement from code. We need an animation to do it. Thanks to the divided transpossibilities inside the locomotion, the first idea was quite simple. We replicate only the plan and the path from host among the peers. The problem is that the peer can be in a slightly different position than the host. 
So we generate a new step from our local position to that of the host, so that we end up in the same spot at the beginning of the path. To compensate lag over the network, we do what classical debt reckoning would do. We try to predict host movement ahead of us. We had a lot of useful data here. Motion graph uh, is the same. We know its path and also the plan. Yes, as I mentioned earlier, the plan includes steps which uh, have the measure we have the measured exact state at the end, so we can approximate exactly where host will end up ahead of time and when the host will be there. But reality is never that simple. We replicate data in some intervals. That means not every single frame. Host may plan and execute steps between replication intervals that we never receive. Additionally, we track host for each of the objects in the game separately. Usually, the player, is, uh, which is the closest one to the AI, becomes its owner. That's me that means that the owning host of the locomotion can change at any given moment. What is that a, what is, why is that a problem? Because all of that creates motion graph discontinuity. This means that you can receive a state from host which is impossible to reach from the current local state. There is a transition from start step to move step, but there is no transition the other way. We can't go from move to start because we are already moving. This is an issue. We could find an alternate path to this decision point through the motion graph, like we can go through the stop animation, but that would require an additional step and waste precious time. We don't want uh, to cause any more desynchronization. And also the number of steps we can make is limited to two. Since the replicated step is already the, the second one, we can only generate a single step, uh, the first one. So how we decided to fix that. We handle most of the impossible transitions with so-called fake steps. What are those? They are created procedurally in runtime, depending on the data received from the host. We have to get creative here. For example, for a transition from move to start, we suppo that supposedly comes from the host, we don't try to generate that start. We simply do another step that finishes at the same position and direction as that start would do. We have quite a lot of different fake step, steps suiting different cases. And as usual, the locomotion planner will consider many variants and pick the best one. It quickly turns out that most of the steps can be skipped without players noticing, as long as they are related to moving on the ground. But this is not the case for the jump. Jumps need special handling. In our system, jumps are atomic, which means that they cannot be interrupted, and if the external system forces us to do so, we consider it a bug. There are two, uh, two cases in which we allow it, exiting into the ragdoll or to the dying animation. This means that we don't allow AI ownership, uh, the AI owning host to change during the jump. That's because there is no way to blend out from jump at any arbitrary point. We are moving between two separate nav mesh islands. Jump takes a special care of this and with the physics. So for any outside system, AI position that doesn't lay on the nav mesh is considered invalid. We cannot finish an animation there and we cannot start an animation there. So, since the jump cannot be interrupted, we cannot jump locally on peer before host does. Host may change its mind and don't jump at all, for example, if different requests come from its AI. If it happens that we reach jump connection on the nav mesh on the peer before the host confirmation comes, we have to wait, slow time a little bit and maybe apply that movement animation in place. On the other hand, when peer is late and host already jumped through the connection and is moving away from us, we execute a special panic jump. This one instructs the planner that we cannot fail. Whatever plan variant is most promising, that one will be chosen, even if we aren't properly aligned or we don't meet the dimension requirements. This way, we ensure that even in the most pessimistic situations, we still jump. It may not look good, but it's better than teleporting character out of the blue, so it means it's good enough. And here in this video, you can see an example of replication in the wild. There are some small differences in plan execution between the peer and the host, but it's nothing that our planner can't handle. And this is the last slide in the replication part. So let's summarize what we learned. 
I'll explore some of the tools that we used along the way. So commotion is animation driven. It's based on the motion graph that is built automatically from supplied animations. It uses it to plan the motion along a path ahead of time. More animations, the better. Improved quality, more cases can be covered. Each animation type has tightly defined requirements it must follow. Animations are corrected in runtime to fit the geometry better. And replication in co-op. Having a plan and motion graph really helps, helps here. And if it doesn't, we fake it till we make it. We couldn't do all of this if not for our set of tools and debug features. Most importantly, simulation in editor. It allows us to quickly iterate both over the locomotion code and the animation assets without restarting the editor. Motion graph compilation is uh, multi-threaded and it's insanely fast. It only takes a few milliseconds and all the motion graphs in the whole game uh, can be compiled in less than 20 seconds. We can spawn an AI instance with enabled locomotion in the editor and issue commands to it on the go. And the second tool is anim monitor which oversees the animation simulation, allows us to record it and inspect it later. It consists with a timeline that we can rewind like a video, and we can see an updated AI pose, animation graph state, and the internal locomotion state at any moment. You can see an monitor here in action. We simulate some motion, then we can pause, rewind, go forward again, and we can do it for as many characters as we want, even for all of them all at once. This was the core of our workflow. When we encountered an issue in the game, we would record it and inspect it in the anim monitor. Then we would save the uh, request that was sent to the locomotion. Then we could repeat that request inside the editor on, a, uh, on the same map, isolated from the rest of the game. We would iterate over the code and the assets until the issue is fixed. The results, we were quite happy with the results. System works really good. It fulfilled all the requirements and has a good tooling. Implementation has excellent performance and reasonable memory usage, and it's also streaming friendly. So uh, for the case of the Dying Light 2, it's all done. But this is not the end. We have a new fantasy project in the works. We want to continue improving the system. So as with any system, we want to re improve usability. We want to relax our animation requirements so that animation can be more about style than the geometry requirements. And we want, to, uh, we want anim monitor recording to be saved to a file so that we can uh, inspect it later in a dedicated tool. We want to improve quality. We want to implement pose warping, which means that we can correct root motion how much we want and the pose will uh, be adjusted accordingly. And we want to have a dedicated velocity blending. Some of the animations that we use are for our different speeds, and the blending between them can look really junky. Uh, and also, we want to support the non-bipedal locomotion. Thanks to the team at Techland, everything presented here today is a result of a team effort, not mine alone. A lot of programmers, animators, technical animators, and QAs worked together on this. If you want to create a cool stuff like that, join us. We are hiring. Thanks for listening. You can follow me on Twitter. This is my handle. Visit us at the Techland booth at the venue. We have juice. There will be a lot of amazing people there. So if you want to say hi or have a chat, please come. You can catch me there after the talk. I will be there for about an hour. And I guess we have time for the Q&A. I, I have a question um, because in Dying Light 2, there is a wall running mechanic. And I wanted to ask you if the wall running mechanic is also driven by the nav mesh. Is there like a dedicated um, vertical nav mesh that you had to bake throughout the places? But at the same time, I'm thinking you can do this in other places than just a dedicated. So the question is about wall running in Dying Light yeah. 2, uh, how we did that. So our Navmosh uh, does support uh, uh, generating connections on the walls and also on the like vertical geometry. It's not the same Navmesh. 
the, the, the nav mesh that is generated on the ground is like connected meshes that can be like uh, traversed at uh, various styles, but the vertical ones need uh, dedicated uh, jumping animations and they are more restricted. Okay, thank you. Hey, thanks for the talk. Um, I have a question. What happens if, um, uh, when you pre-plan your movement and uh, pre-cache the animations, uh, what happens if uh, something goes in the way and uh, changes your plans? Uh, for example, uh, there are cranes which um, do like this kind of motion, right? <laughs> like levers. Uh, so the player can jump on top of it and it changes its position. So now, an infected suddenly has to adjust to the new height of the jump or something like that. And how do you solve that kind of um, problem? Uh, we didn't because we don't support uh, nav mesh or locomotion or on dynamically uh, moved objects. So that case with the crane uh, is not really an issue for us because we don't have to care. All right, thank you. Any more questions? Okay, if that's all, thank you once again.